let's praise the Lord today. Come on, put your hands together.
Shake off despair as I sing out your name. A victory dance, I will dance out in vain. I will crush this All of my fear, I will turn into pain. Come on, shake off despair as I sing out your name. A victory dance, I will dance out in vain. I will crush this Come on, sing it again. Oh, and all of my fear.
Just take a moment right now. Just lift up your hands across the room. I want you to just take a moment and thank Him. Thank Him for resurrection life. Thank Him. Thank Him for resurrection life. Thank Him for freedom. Come on, thank Him for freedom. Come on, out of your heart today, out of your spirit today, just worship Him, worship Him, exalt Him. Give Him thanks and praise. He's worthy. He's worthy. We exalt you, Jesus. There's no other name. We exalt you, be exalted, oh God, be exalted, oh God, oh, we set our eyes on you, Jesus, we set our hearts on you, Jesus, you're the reason we're here today, it's all about you. cross you crucify all my sin and shame it was washed by your mercy you are the treasure I find my reason for living so let my life become an offering to the one who is worthy
Sing that. Just take a minute, would you? Lift our hands and declare it.
Just the voices sing. Come on, man. I lift my voice. Let it be, let it be a sweet, sweet sound. Let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Thank you, Jesus. You know, with the depth of emotion and out of the depth of our soul and in our spirit, when we sing a song like that, we're telling the one who saved us and set us free and changed our life. And without him, every one of us in this room would be a mess. <laughs> but do you realize the love he has for us? incomparable, unmeasurable. There's an old hymn that says, if you took a quill and you took a pen and it, you let every drop of water on this earth be the ink that you're trying to write out and compare his love for us, it's not possible to do because he loves us so. He's so very intentional with everything that he does. And I know this has been a crazy week for North Alabama in this area. Like, <laughs> wow. But you know, when you look outside, when the snow apocalypse comes and it shuts us down, the North knows how to do this, the South doesn't. Brings everything to a halt. It's cold, it's frozen, it feels dark, it feels lonely. We're isolated, we can't go anywhere. You can only bake that much more soup. You're getting on each other's nerves. You're cold. <laughs> Somebody just wants to go to Chick-fil-A. You know, that's all we want. <laughs> we just make life better. But let me tell you something. Let me remind you something in that message I preached in September about seasons and about the importance of not skipping over seasons. In all four seasons, the most important season is the one that we don't want to go through, and that's the one we're in right now. Because in the midst of that darkness, in the midst of the cold, in the midst of the hard earth, in the midst of a frozen snow that we couldn't even make a snowman, in the midst of all of that, in winter, the root system of everything living is taking that opportunity to go down deep into the earth 
for this purpose so that when spring comes and the new growth comes, it can withstand what is growing. That's right. Never fear a winter season because he's in the midst of all of that. And he loves you enough, whether you like it or not, to place you in a winter season so that your roots will go down deep and you can withstand the growth that is coming after your obedience. Amen. Amen. I think that's I think that's why I wanted to sing this song. I'm dancing out of the snow. I'm dancing. I'm dancing out of the ice. But here's the thing of what Lisa said. And I want to I want to we're going to transition out of this today. Today is the beginning moment of not something that's ending, but a new beginning. That's where God has brought us in this season. We just ended up our days of prayer and fasting, and, and I know for some of you that was hard, all the kids. And, listen, I don't, if, if you were fasting work, then okay, you jumped in. Did anybody fast work while you were? All right, praise God. Thank you for enjoying the journey. <laughs> I was just eating to try to avoid my children. I was, was eating all I could. And, but this morning as I got up, I, I, you know, it's one of those mornings I said, Lord, is, I really would love a word from you. I didn't want to pray, play uh, biblical roulette. Anybody ever done that where you just say, come on, Jesus, and you just open your Bible and you're just like, all right, right there. And then, uh, you know, you realize if you do that, you can end up in a hellish moment right there if you falls on the wrong thing. But I opened up my Bible, and I preached in Birmingham and Trustful on Thursday night. And it was just God just met us in a very powerful way in this ministry there. And I'm about to leave, and an 11-year-old girl gave me a card that she had she was working on during the service. I thought, well, at least I got her busy. She was doing something. She was 11, 11 years old. And um, she wrote me this little word, and it's very private because it was actually a word from the Lord. But where I stuck it in my Bible, I opened my Bible, and on one side was Psalm 108 of the priesthood of Melchizedek. He said there's an order that I, there's a new order of priesthood. I'm like, we get to get in on that because that was Jesus. But then on the other side of her little card she gave me was Psalm 107. And my eyes fell to this this morning. And what Lisa's just said, what we just sung, and here's what it says. They will see in our history the faithful love of the Lord. And I said, I've never seen that. I read it again. They will see in our history the faithful love of the Lord. Let me tell you something, church. You can go digging around. You can get every nook, every cranny. You won't find perfection, but there's one thing you're going to find if you go digging in the details because it's not only the God who was. We celebrate that. We, we celebrate the God who is, but because of what was, you go digging in the details, there's something you're going to find about the history here, about the history of our life, and that is you will find the faithful love of the Lord. He's faithful. I'm telling you, how many can look back in your history and discover the faithful love of God? Even when you had flipped out, even when you were messed up, you look back in your history and the faithful love of the Lord. He said, look in your history pages. Never forget my faithfulness because if I was faithful then, I'm faithful now. And look what you got to look forward to with just what's up ahead. What a faithful father. What a faithful love of God. And today, I'm so thankful you braved the snow, the ice. We had men, Pastor Steve Sharp, you and Derek, Pastor Derek, and all of the men who showed up, they came and cleaned this entire parking lot so that you could not slip slide away. But there was 
because today is an amazing day connecting not only the past but the present and launching our future. And tonight, you don't want to miss tonight. In this transitional piece that uh, I'm so honored today to have my pastor and a bishop, he and Bishop Paul Zink and Sharon Zink, he will be handing up some of the portion tonight. But could you just thank God for Bishop being here today? And Sharon, love you. 25 years ago, they said, we believe in you. And uh, they sent us out with a $54,000 offering that they received for us that Sunday before we moved. And that launched the Rock Family Worship Center. And, uh, and I'm so grateful today. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Well, won't you turn to about five or ten people? We got, I could, we, we're not going to ramble here. Come on, turn around, look at them and say, you look so much better. Good morning, Rock family. How's everybody doing this morning? Come on, you can do better than that. How's everybody doing this morning? Whoa, much better? Hey, what an honor to be here today and to be with you. Listen, we want to recognize some very special people in the room. If you're here for the very first time, you don't mind letting us know about it, would you just wave at us? We don't want to embarrass you, but we'd love to recognize you. All of our first-time guests today, just come on, wave at me. Let me see. I'm looking for you. Yes, 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 yes. Come on, church, you can do better than that. Give it up for all of our guests this morning. We know this, that you could be anywhere you chose to be here, and it's an honor to be with you today. Thank you for coming out. Our ushers are looking for you. They have a, a little invitation to Connection Point. It's a reception that we do immediately following service. It gives you a chance to ask any questions you might have, but really it's selfish. It's a chance for us to just look at you eyeball to eyeball, say thank you personally for being here today. And again, you can grab a snack or something before you head out to lunch. But it's an honor to have you here today. And uh, it's going to be an incredible day, as Pastor Rusty has just talked about. There's so many friends, so many family members that are here today uh, just to celebrate this, this time of transition. And so... Uh, I'm, I'm just excited, beside myself about what the future holds and want to say thank you to some special friends that are here from Louisiana and Texas and uh, folks that have come. Um, I, I, I just, I'm just telling you, I'm, I'm sideways about it. Got surprised last night and this morning by a few of those and obviously having all of these heroes of the faith that are here. I, I, there's no way to describe or tell you the kind of legacy that's sitting in this room right now. I'm telling you, if you knew the amount of ministry and favor and grace that is bestowed upon people in this room right now that they're walking under, you would just crumble. I'm telling you. And uh, it's just, it's, it's an amazing time to be alive and especially to be here for this weekend. Listen, we have a few announcements that we have to make and we do this every single week. And we think it's important because this is how you stay connected. This is how you take this really great big thing. And then just continue to make it about relationship and about community. And that's one way is for you to stay in communication. So if you haven't done it yet, be sure to do this. Download the, yes, you guys are learning. Yes, get the app. That's making sure that you stay connected to all the things that we do, ways for you to get connected, ways for you to serve. If there's any weather information, which we got some of that over the week, all through the fast. Many of you guys got all of our daily devotional stuff. And I want to say thank you to all of our pastors and all of our people who faithfully went through this fast with us. I know God is doing something incredible during that. Amen? Hey, listen, there's an announcement for fine arts. We had that scheduled last week. Of course, we got snowed out and weren't able to do that. So we're picking that up this Wednesday. So if you have a student that's wanting to be involved with fine arts, or you're a parent that's interested in showing off some talent that you have given to your kids. Uh, we encourage you to sign up and be a part of that. You can do that at the app. But also you can just show up for our meeting 630 this Wednesday night. That's happening here, so you don't want to miss out on that. Uh, it's a great opportunity for our kids to get together, build a community, showcase what God's gifted them to do. And they're going on a competition, and they go all over the place. And over the last few years, we have just done a dynamic job with our students. And uh, that's credit to Kat. 
Holder and her team and all that she does. And so you know her, you know her well. And she's doing an amazing job. Last but not least, obviously, we kick off today. Revive Conference is kicked off. You're going to get a special treat today from our guest speaker. And Pastor Rusty's going to handle the invitation on that. But can I tell you, do not miss out on this. You can still be a part of Revive Conference. That's Monday and Tuesday. We have some incredible communicators, the best in the world. I promise you that. And so Monday night, we're going to be hearing from Manny Arango. And then after that, John Brevere. And then today, uh, you get a distinct privilege to sit with a, a giant in the faith. And I just can't wait for you to hear from Dr. Mark Rutland today. And uh, so it's going to be a great time. Revive Conference. It's not too late to be a part of that. Make sure that you sign up so that we know how to prepare for you. It's going to be a great time. You can do all of these things from the app. So I appreciate you taking the time to do that. Would you do me a favor? Would you welcome our senior pastor, Pastor Rusty Nelson, to the stage? I'm back. That was quick. I didn't know I was back that room. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, guys. <laughs> Love you. Love you. Thank you. That's, thank you. It's overwhelming. Thank you. And um, I love you. Thank God for what he's doing here. And listen, I'd attend here if I wasn't the pastor. And uh, you're about to find that out. I see, I'm about to keep my word after all these years. To find out. And man, I'd attend here if I wasn't the pastor. And, and uh, that's how much I believe in the vision of the uniqueness of we, God calls every church with a post on the wall. And he put us here with a post, with an assignment, with a responsibility. And, um, and I'm so grateful for that, man. And I, I can't wait for all that he has for us. Right now, it's actually offering time. We get to give. Can we thank God today? I think two Sundays ago, um, during the service, we, we do our first fruit. And I think there was well over 60,000 that came in to go to Israel. And uh, so we'll be sending out those, uh, those funds. And I'm so grateful for that, um, for our first fruit offering. And uh, thank you for your faithfulness. As we continue to be salt and light in this city, in this region, it's through the faithfulness of God's people, we're able to get outside the house. We're able to put feet to what we do and not just expect things on Sunday morning. Man, I found Jesus a lot more sweeter on Monday, even than Sunday. And just walking, being, being, just being an expression of his heart. And I want to thank you as a congregation. Thank you. The you that are online today, all of our campuses that will be joining in just a moment. It is, it is so amazing to be able to walk this journey out and be able to just... I, you know, I keep using this phrase, be Jesus. I, that's such a weighty responsibility. But I'm glad he's in us. And that's what gives him the ability through us to minister through us. And so I'm grateful for that. If you're husband and wife, please join hands. If you're a single or single parent, we come into agreement today with a covenant God. Father, thank you for the joy of giving. And today, once again, we give cheerfully. We don't give it a manipulation or some sob story, we give simply because we are in love with you. <laughs> we don't give to get something from you, Lord. We give because you've graced us to give. And what an honor, Lord, to be trusted. Lord, you are the one who's worthy of trust. But when you, when you give us finance, when you give us time, when you give us, Lord, talents, Lord, therein you, according to our abilities, you empower us to be able to respond to you. Lord, I pray for every household. I pray your blessing over every husband, wife. I pray today over every single, every single parent. Thank you for your faithfulness. I pray for our widows and widowers. That Lord, through the middle of it all, even navigating through transition and painful moments, 
you are still Jehovah Jireh, the God who sees and the God who provides. I pray for entrepreneurs in this room. I pray you would bless them with creative and witty ideas. God, I pray that the very thing that they've been dreaming in their heart, that, Father, the risk of faith, Lord, it's if there, there is no faith without risk. And, Lord, that moment of stepping out in faith, I pray, God, you would meet them right in the middle of the dream you've placed in their heart. And, Father, never let us, any of us forget, you have blessed us to be a blessing. We love you today, and we honor you with the tithe that you said belongs to you. And so we say, thank you, Jesus, today. And everybody said, amen. amen. God bless you as you give ushers. Thank you for serving us. As we all know, as many most of us give online, you just hit the QR code, and it'll take you to a safe environment. Or as Pastor Scott said, just download the app, and that takes care of everything. Uh, I'm also thankful to have... In this morning service, we have a number of people that are coming in this evening for the evening service, but uh, I am so glad he flew in last night, and he is a brother from another mother. He is uh, like, he's not only an amazing man of God, and that I have, we have partnered as a church with all these years for Israel, but um, thank you, my dear friend. Bishop Robert Stern is here. Thank you for coming in for this special time together. Would you stand? Let everybody see you. Amen. Glad he's here. Amen. Well, today, uh, we didn't have any videos. All that's for tonight. And we're just going from one thing to the other. Just This is called Pass the Mic. Is that all right? I love it when you can't figure out everything. You know, actually, welcome to my world. And just... That's been my life. But I am so honored today. Back uh, two years ago, two and a half years ago, when I had an accident and I went through that season where they set me down. Actually, the doctor set me down. Um, he actually did it through my wife. And um, she walked in one day and said, you're done? And I said, well, I feel like I could be. I don't know. But she said, you're not, you can't be in the pulpit. So for 20 weeks, I was out. Dr. Mark Rutland was doing his leadership institute here with us. He had been coming for three months. And uh, this happened in September and October. He came to do his final week of, of leadership training, which is the most phenomenal training in all the world. And um, he came over to see me, he kept, because he's become not only a mentor, but another spiritual father in our life. We have many teachers, but we have few fathers. And I don't just call anyone a spiritual father because I, my own dad and mom, I have, I have the greatest heroes in my life who, who raised us, my brother and I. But God has planted at key moments of our life, spiritual fathers and mothers. You'll hear from one of those tonight as he directs this service as we step into this transitional moment. But God brought Dr. Mark Rutland into mine and Lisa's life at a very just key time. And he came over to see me and he said, he was checking on us and they came to the house and we were sitting there talking and I, I'm just trying to navigate through what's happened. I didn't remember a lot of things. I was having trouble with my memory um, which was a blessing uh, months later because then you have selective memory and you, you know, that can be a God gift at that point. But I remember saying to him, Dr. Rutland, I, I don't, just things are, how do you know if God is shifting your season? And I'll never forget what he said to me. He said, you know, son, it can never be too early but it can be too late. And it hit me in such a way that I began to seek God, Lisa and I together. And I realized, God, you never take us from something, you're not taking us to something. And you are setting this house up for the greatest days that it's ever known. And I'm grateful for that. And I'm grateful for a man of God his list of how God has used he and Miss Allison 
It, it is so lengthy. Founders of Global International, which is a ministry that is missions and what they've done around the world, but how God has used him to take Southeastern University and see it shift and change into the major university it is today, to seeing Or Roberts University in its, in, in its the depth of its decline and to have a man of God come in and breathe life to it and to see where it is today. But I thank God for all of that. But I can tell you, I thank God for the friend, for the mentor, and for a spiritual father that has poured into Lisa and I and who's here today on this special weekend. Would you please give a Rock Family Worship Center welcome to Dr. Mark Rutland. Would you do that? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Pastor, thank you for that extravagant introduction. If I'd have known you were going to make that good of an introduction, I would have brought my wife. I wonder. <laughs> I feel that she does not understand how important I am. <laughs> so you've heard all these words, these nouns, hero, father. They're all euphemisms for old. But I'm cool with that. Well, this is a, a wonderful day here in Minnesota. And <laughs> all the little southern children that had never seen snow, they ran out. Mommy, mommy, grits are falling out of the sky. <laughs> You're a jolly church. <laughs> you should travel with me and see some churches where laughter has never touched this face. <laughs> well, it is always an honor to be here and a privilege, uh, but especially on this huge and momentous time for the church and for the lives and the families that are involved here. This, this is a huge moment, and it is um, a a great honor in my life, something I will always treasure that I was allowed to even be included in the event. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you, Scott. Thank you very much. If you have your Bibles, if you'll take those and turn, if you will, to Paul's letter to the church at Galatia, what we call Galatians chapter 4. I want to speak today on the fullness of time. Galatians chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors all the time appointed of the father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, now just compare the last of verse 3 and the first of verse 4, in bondage under the elements of the world. What is the fundamental element that presides over the activities of the world? Time. So while we were in time, even so when we were children in time, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law of what? Yes, the, he's talking about the law of Israel, but a, a more transcendent law. The law of time, that the timeless, pre-existent, co-eternal, second person of the Trinity, the Word, which was God and is God, became flesh subject to time. This was the greatest transition that the Word experienced, was to move from timelessness into time. Put your hands on your Bible, if you will, and let's pray together. Padre bendito celestial, te damos gracias por tu presencia con nosotros en esta mañana, porque te necesitamos mucho. Necesitamos un palabra de, de esperanza. Ayúdame, por favor. 
Lléname con tu Espíritu Santo y úsame a su gloria si es posible. Y por favor, glorifica tu nombre en este mensaje. Lord, we praise you, we worship you, that your word transcends language, generation, geography, and time. Come, Holy Spirit. In the mighty name, Jesus, the strong Son of God. Amen, amen, and amen. In 100 B.C., as men reckon time, Julius Caesar was born. It was even locally news. He was born into a prominent Roman family. And there was some news. Nobody knew who he was to become, but it was news. A new family had been, a new baby had been born into the Julian family. Meanwhile, halfway around the world in a remote Roman province called Judea, a man named Eleazar was born. It was not news. Just another Jew in a faraway village perched on the shoulder of the mighty Roman Empire it was not news. In 80 B.C., Octavian was born. He was Julius Caesar's nephew, and he was to become his adopted son, Julius Caesar's adopted son. It was news. Eliezer's son, Matan, was born. It was not news. It was hardly an event, except perhaps in Eliezer's family. In 44 B.C., one of the greatest news items in the history of the world happened. Julius Caesar was assassinated in the outer chamber of the Roman Senate, stabbed to death by a cadre of Roman senators. Talk about news. It plunged the world into basically what was the First World War. It was fought in Europe, Africa, and Asia. And it was news. What was not news was that Eliezer's grandson, Joseph, was born. It was not significant. I suspect it wasn't considered to be a significant event in Nazareth. And Nazareth was hardly a significant village in Judea, and Judea was not a significant province in the Roman Empire. In 27 B.C., Octavian won the Civil War and he became Caesar Augustus. That was news. That was huge. That changed the geopolitics of the ancient world. It changed Roman life. Octavian Caesar Augustus saw himself as Rome's chief of culture. He made laws about marriage and about religion, certainly not Christianity, but paganism. He formulated laws about the, the exercise of religion in the Roman Empire. He changed and transformed the bureaucratic structure of the Roman Empire, made it efficient. He considered himself also the chief executive officer. He built roads that extended the might and power of the Roman Empire. He established the first postal system in the Roman Empire, Rome's first police force, the first fire brigade. But perhaps Caesar Augustus' most significant move, he decided that there was no use to own an empire if you couldn't tax an empire. Evidently, he was a Democrat. And so in preparation for taxing even the remotest corners of his empire, he decided that he needed to know where everybody was so when it came time for the taxation, he could find them. So province by province, not the whole world at the same time, but province by province, he ordered that people would report for a census Not simply to know how many people over which he ruled, but to know where they were. 
And so that was news. What was not news was that Joseph, the grandson of Matan, the great-grandson of Eliezer, took his little pregnant fiance and went to Bethlehem because he was of the lineage of David. And it was not news. In 14 AD, Caesar Augustus died, and that was news. Tiberius became the Caesar, and that was news. But about the same time, a 12-year-old boy went for his bar mitzvah in Jerusalem and left behind by his parents, he bedazzled the elders with both his questions and his answers. But it was not on the front page of a newspaper in Rome or anywhere else. In 29 AD, Caesar Tiberius celebrated his 15th anniversary. And that was news. What was not news was that an unknown and unsung Jewish prophet named John was beheaded in the basement of a prison in faraway Judea. And in 30 AD, a year later, another Jewish prophet was nailed to a Roman cross. And it was not news. It was not considered a significant event Just another Jew plowed under the chariot wheels of another empire. God doesn't see time the way we do. History, the definition, the classical definition of history is the record of change over time. We live in this dimension of time. It rules over us. We, we who are older, everybody here over the age of 50, would you raise your hand if you can? Yeah. <laughs> Turn to someone near you there that did not raise their hand and say, you have no idea what time is about. <laughs> now say to them again, and I resent you for it. We live, we live in the dimension of time. We live in history. We understand what is happening. Historical events, momentous moments in our lives, in our families, in our churches, in your ministry. But we tend to mistakenly impose time and history on God. God is above history. He's greater than Caesar Augustus, greater than the Roman Empire, greater than all the kings and tyrants and nations and armies. We must have faith in the God that transcends history while we still live in history. You must be in this world, but not of it. We live in time. We live in history. We live in our personal history, in the history of nations and cities and and ministries, but we are not really the stuff of time because our God is not of time. God is a a God that deals in the midst of the apparent those things which are not apparent, those things that seem huge in history. If it If one were to take a thousand courses on history taught at a thousand universities, you will study about battles and empires and kings and transitions from one Caesar to the next and one king to the next. And you will be told that those are true reality, but they are not true reality. What is true reality is four generations of a Jewish family in a remote town named Nazareth. That is transcendent reality. Because God is a God above human history. God seems to have this, the risk of sounding blasphemous, God seems to have this quirky sense of humor. It's like he enjoys playing jokes on history. 
Pharaoh, who despised the Jews, the most ancient and mysterious of all hatreds is Jew hatred. It is, it is satanic and transcends history. So Pharaoh decided and ordered that all Jewish Hebrew at that time, all Hebrew male babies would be strangled. The female babies would be kept alive for obvious purposes. But the male babies, when they're born, would be strangled. He said, that's my command in history because in history I am the emperor, Pharaoh, if you will, of Egypt, and therefore my historical command is that the newborn Hebrew baby boys will be killed because he said, I am the Lord of history. But the Lord of history said, you want to kill all the Hebrew male babies, I'll, I'll actually give you one to raise. That's, that's a joke. You, you see that, don't you? You can almost see God turn to the angels and say, watch this. That Pharaoh's daughter plucks a baby from the Nile River. In fact, his name Moses means drawn out. It's an Egyptian name to be lifted out. So she names him and takes him home. But she is not confused. She knows it's a Hebrew baby. She hires his natural mother to come to the palace and nurse him until he's weaned. She raises him as a prince. What, what a cosmic transcendent joke. Herod the Great said that the next king of Israel will be born in my palace. And God turned to the angels and said, watch this. <laughs> and the true king is born not in Herod's palace, but about eight miles away in an even smaller village than Nazareth. God is above human history. We cannot always tell what God is doing. This is such a tremendous hope for us. Can you, can you understand what it means? It means that when history seems to be unfolding full of blessings, when time after time after time in time you are being blessed, we praise the God of human history, the God that is above human history. But when human history seems to blow up in our faces, if we all wake up in the morning with Chinese tanks in our driveway, God is still God. So I, I pastored some years ago a really difficult church. I mean, they're just some churches, you know, God bless them. This church just about made me crazy. And it was difficult. It was difficult for my family. We struggled. Years later, when I escaped, moved, and... Uh, I was the president of a university, and God was blessing that time in our lives. I looked back on that time, and at a Thanksgiving meal, all my children now married and grandchildren gathered around, I decided it was time for a mea culpa. And I, I said, look, everybody, I, I want you to look at me for a moment. I think back to that time we were at that church, and I said, I just feel I ought to apologize to all of you. I, I, I thought God sent me there. I really did, but I said, it was a tough time. It was a tough time for you. You're all married now, but you were kids then, and I know it was tough, and I, I, if you're wounded from that, I want you to forgive me. Our son, who is a pastor over in Georgia of a great church, he looked up at me and he said, Dad, why does every story have to be about you? <laughs> and I said, what in the world do you mean? He said, if we had not gone to that church, he said, I would not have met this little brown-eyed wife that you adore. These three grandsons of yours would not have been born. He said, maybe God didn't send us to that church for you. Maybe he sent us to that church for her.
I don't know about you, Pastor. I hate it when God speaks through members of my family. I, But uh, this, is, this is a huge historical moment in this church as we understand moments and as we understand history. It's huge for you, but it may not have anything to do with you. What if there's some kid who's in a walk-up tenement flat eight blocks from here who's waking up in the morning and his dad's drunk and his mother's on dope and he's saying to himself, there's got to be something better than this. Maybe this is for him. So not only is God above human history, God is also before human history. In the 8th century B.C., as we reckon time and history, Isaiah said, in time, Messiah will come. Eight centuries. <laughs> so everybody kept saying, it's so long. How long, O Lord? Because they're counting in time. But the God who is transcendent, the God who is I am before time is, is saying, no, it's, it's the blink of an eye. Because he says, I am before time. 650 years before the coming of Messiah, Jeremiah spoke about Messiah. Just before the tiny crease in time when Messiah arrived, the God of timelessness spoke to a barren woman and said, you're going to have a boy, and his name is going to be John. He's not the Messiah. He is not that light. He's just going to be a voice crying in a wilderness. He spoke to a prophet named Simeon and said, your history will not come to an end until he who was before and is I am before history will appear in your history. And he stood in the temple and said, this baby is the Lord of history. Do you see what hope that gives us? History is not happening to God. History is unfolding in the palm of his hand. Do you think for one moment God wakes up every morning and picks up the New York Times to find out what's going on. Whoa, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> now i got to change plans. God is I am. He's never I was. He's never I will be. He is I am. The ever-present, present tense, ultimate reality. He was, he is not, was before time. He is before time. He is the Lord of history. He is Lord before history. But then finally, God, who is beyond human history, can enter human history. That's the mystery that we call the incarnation. That when Jesus came into human history, he had to become subject to the reality of time. Time had to work on him. He had to grow, get older, learn things. He had to experience the things in history. If that's not real, then the incarnation's not real. Incarnation, meaning from the Latin word carnami, uh, we use it in Spanish. You go to a Mexican restaurant, you order chili con carne. You want chili with flesh in it. So Jesus is just God con carne. <laughs> the transcendent, transcendent, timeless God who became subject to time, but in order to be subject to time, he had to become real flesh. 
An angel couldn't do it. A theological metaphor couldn't do it. He had to be subject to time. <laughs> the proof of that had to be blood. If Jesus had lived in time, a perfect life, worked all his miracles, taught everything that he taught, and died of old age in a nursing home in Jerusalem, we're all going to hell. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. So the timeless, pre-existent, co-eternal, second person of the Trinity, the Word that was with God and was God, became flesh and dwelt among us, subject to time. All the ravages of time. The pain that we know Jesus experienced on the cross, this may be a shock to you. That's not the first time he ever experienced pain. He worked in his father's shop. We'll not quibble over whether it was a carpenter shop or stonemason. Everybody's writing whole books over that. It, it's like not important. But when he worked in his father's store, whatever it was, hammer and stone or nails or whatever, at some point or another, he hit his thumb. And I know he said, really? <laughs> because he was experiencing the reality of a human body in time. So God said, God said, as you reckon time, you see the passage of years and decades and centuries and millennia, but there will come this moment where all of time is fulfilled in one moment. And the word will become flesh and dwell among us and conquer time. How then shall we live? We live confident. We live unshaken by what time can throw at us. We live unperturbed by the transitions of life. We live confident that God, who is above and beyond and before human history, will still be God when human history comes to a screeching halt. There will come that moment when the sky will break open and the God who is beyond time will roll up the clouds like a dirty tablecloth and we will rise to meet him in the air. In that moment, we will move beyond time. Time will have no more effect on us than gravity. <laughs> and let me tell you something else. All the people who think they know exactly how that's going to happen are probably all wrong. <laughs> I think God leans over our theology classrooms listening to somebody lecture on the book of Revelation and he turns to the angels and says, did you know that? <laughs> Listen, when Jesus returns and he closes the book on time, and we rise to meet him in the air, even if you got it right, even if everything that you taught and preached about end time prophecy, even if you got it right, as you rise to meet him in the air, you will not look across the expanse of heaven at someone who disagreed with you and say, nani, nani, boo, boo. <laughs> and if you got any of it wrong, no one will say, this is not what I taught and I'm not going. You'll rise like the rest of us and keep your mouth shut. So, but absent that moment, we will all of us experience the end of time. What is, what is that event? that signals the end of our history, the history of our lives. It's the thing that we've tried to put some word on. We call it death. We have to have some way to talk about it. How does my history in time give way 
to what's next. So death is a doorway through which we pass from time into timelessness. We don't pass from time into a different time. You ever hear people say the goofiest things about heaven? Some of this, I hope there's golf in heaven. You ever hear that? I can just assure you there's no golf in heaven. The Bible says God will wipe away every tear. <laughs> or whatever it is. Is there, is, there, is there fishing in heaven or is there something? I hope there's something. You know why that is? It's because we try to impose our concept of time on timeless eternity. I've actually heard people say, I don't, I'm afraid I'll get bored. How long can you just float around playing a guitar and singing? How, I'll get bored. No, but that's because you're thinking of timeless eternity in terms of time. Time is all we know. So we want to impose it on timelessness. Now think of this. When you step through the door called death, you step into timelessness. So you don't need to worry about getting bored. Imagine the inexplicable, unutterable ecstasy of your first moment in heaven. The, the first split second in heaven, the ecstasy you will feel. Now you cannot impose on that feeling the transition of time. Because what we think is, yes, the first time you kiss your girlfriend, it's ecstatic. But at 80, <laughs> it's, you know, it's kind of become more friendly. my wife I said baby I'm 76 I feel good I I can still chase you around she said yeah but you can't remember why <laughs> so change we take that we take that change and try to impose it on the unutterable ecstasy of heaven that first split second, as we understand time, in heaven, we'll never suffer from time. You won't get bored because there's no time. You're in a whole nother dimension. So it means... That because we serve the God who is before human history and above human history and has the power to enter human history, we do not have to be afraid of history. I will not fear time because God is beyond time. But it also means that because of what he did in the fullness of time, sending his only son from timelessness into time that he might return to timelessness and make a place for us, I also don't have to fear the end of my own personal history. So when I was uh, 22, right at the end of the Civil War, I <laughs> it's, it's so rude to laugh at a guest speaker that... I went to pastor my first church. A 22-year-old boy should not be given a driver's license, let alone a church. I had never, uh, I'd never seen anybody die. I'd never actually been in the room when anybody died. And uh, there was an elderly man in my church, uh, quite elderly, nine years older than I am now. And he was, if everyone lived, a saint of God. I just adored him. He worked in his own store until two weeks before he died, and he fell ill and went in hospital. 
But his body and his will was so strong, he just couldn't seem to let go and cross over. And his family was just exhausted, exhausted by it. So finally, 22-year-old pastor, I said, why don't you all go home and I'll stay with him tonight. And if anything happens, I'll call you. So I stayed there in that lonely hospital room. He laid there with his body sprouting tubes like vines in a coma, silent. In the middle of the night, all of a sudden, he sat bolt upright in the bed and nearly scared the liver out of me. <laughs> he just sat up in the bed, and he looked across the hospital room at a blank wall, and he lifted his hands and said, Oh, beautiful! And he was dead when he hit the pillow. He looked through from time. That was a bad time in his life. He looked through into timelessness, and what he saw means you don't ever have to be afraid of what's on the other side. So, so how do we end this? This is a, a great time in your life. Nothing I'm saying here should diminish that. You're in this time. You three, and you should enjoy it and receive the celebration. It's a great time. And the time ahead of you, pastoring, is time. You live in time. I'm not trying to make light of that. It's an important, huge moment in your history. This is a huge time for you. This is huge. This is a, this is a as you said earlier, a new season. This is a new thing. This is the beginning of something else. This is great. Enjoy this. But to both of you and to all of, all of us, God says the same thing. This is just the blink of an eye. Just the blink of an eye. As good as this is, he says, you ain't seen nothing yet. Now, would you bow your heads and close your eyes all over this great house? If you will do that, please. Let the people around you have privacy. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this moment in time. And Lord, we ask you now to do a timeless thing. Come, Holy Spirit. And with your head bowed and your eyes closed, I'm not going to invite somebody to walk the aisle or something like that, but I want to pray with you right where you are. We need to settle this thing of timelessness. Timelessness it has what we call eternity. It's, it's there. It's real. It's more real than this. But we need to get that settled in your life. Why should you live in time fearful and paranoid about the end of time when it's so, so magnificently prepared by the God who transcends time? Every head bowed and every eye closed. If you'd say, Dr. Mark, Dr. Mark, will you please pray for me? Please pray. I am not ready for the doorway to eternity. And I need to make that decision now to be ready by his grace. If that's you, then you just lift your hand up where you are and take it right back down. Yes, yes, yes. Up high. Hold your hand up high. Up on the risers, down here, down there. Yes, in the center section. It's a big house. Would you hold your hand up high? Yes. Good, good. Over here onto my right side, hold your hand up. Yes, I see you way down there, sir. I see you. God bless you. He's waving to me. Yes, who else? Who else? Quickly, hold your hand up high. Yes, right down there in front of me. Yes, yes. Now I'm going to lead you in a prayer to prepare your soul for timelessness. I'll tell you what let's do. Why don't we all pray it? You say, I've prayed something like this before. Pray it again. Why don't you pray it again? Pray it with me. Will you do that? Heavenly Father, while I am in time, I know that I need your timeless grace. I know that I've sinned. If I were to die right now, I deserve eternal punishment. 
But I know Jesus died in my place. He's gone ahead of me into timelessness to prepare a place that when I die, I might step through the door into timeless splendor. I receive him now as my Messiah, Savior, and the Lord of my life. Write my name in your book so that when I die, I know, say it with faith, I know I will be with you in timeless eternity. I receive it by faith. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen, amen, and amen. God bless you all. Would you stand to your feet? Uh, well, it's about time. Thank you. Thank you. It is about time, but about the one who is timeless. I don't think I've ever been as challenged in more timely moment than right now. And I am so grateful to live right now. Thank you. If you prayed that prayer today, we will have some our leaders up front. You don't have to leave here the way you came. Would you let us pray for you? If you're saying, well, you know what? I need to slip out. Well, there's a card in the seat back in front of you. Would you mind taking just a moment and filling that out so we can at least follow up and call you or send you a letter? We're not going to hound you with anything, but we want to know. We want you to know you found a place who wants to walk with you in discipleship and, and to see you know who you are in Christ because you know who Christ is in you. And so I pray that today, if you need prayer over your finances, over your family, your marriage, if, if anything in your life, our, our leaders are going to be here to pray for you today. Dr. Rutland, thank you for such a timeless message. And I truly mean that, that there could have not been a more perfect moment than right now. Tonight at 6.30, we encourage you to get here early. We have a number of guests that are coming. I know online for our campuses, many are coming in from the campus. You say, where are we? We just, listen, let's just be family tonight. Tonight is, is, is a historic lesson of when God enters a timely moment and he shifts, not narratives, he continues the work that he called us to do. And I'm so grateful. And Pastor Scott and Britt, I'm so grateful for you. And I, I, I said to our elders in our prayer gathering this morning, I just said, you know what is incredible is there were no headhunters out. I've had a few headhunters who wanted my head on a platter. But nothing was sent out to try to find resumes. There's nothing wrong with that. But thank you. For 22 years and thank you that tonight you take the reins of this house and Lisa and I say again we'll follow you till he comes and I'm so grateful I get to fulfill another role of Lisa and I in priesthood and going and ministering to priests and caring for ministers and and going and just representing this house in so many different ways and I'm grateful for that. So tonight, 6.30, will it be live? Yes, it'll be online. But I'm telling you, there's something about being in the room. And I encourage you, come. You see, the parking lot's clear. Come on, to all of you. That, and I know my brother Greg and Laquita, my daughter, my sister-in-law, they are they're up on the mountain. They text me. They said, we, he even took a blowtorch yesterday and tried to torch. And it froze after he torched it. When he told me that, I said, can I just back up a little bit? You have a blowtorch. That in itself was, I couldn't get past that. I'm like, you, I don't know how many people hold, own blowtorches, and my brother has a blowtorch. And, but, but it's going to be a very special night tonight following the service. 
There is even a reception time. And uh, we love you. And um, again, if you need prayer, please come. Let us pray with you. I, and please excuse us, but tonight after service, we're going to be, uh, we'll all be down in the, in the commons area for that reception area. But with, with the guests that we have, I'm going to uh, get them where they need to go to get them back to be here this evening. But may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance on you, give you peace, write his name on you because you belong to him. We love you. We bless you. Pray to see you tonight. If you're not able to come in, we'll see you online. Have a Jesus-filled week. God bless you.